Now we're going to move into curvilinear motion. And curvilinear motion essentially occurs any time a particle is not moving in a straight line. So particles are moving along a curved path. Because they're moving in multiple directions, vector analysis is now required again. So if you go back in previous videos, when we first derived position, velocity, and acceleration, we were very specific to say that position, velocity, and acceleration are all vectors. When we went into rectilinear analysis, we were allowed to use scalars because the particle was only moving in one direction. So it's important to understand the distinction there between when you need to use vector analysis and when it's okay to use scalars. Um, so vector analysis is required because you can have directions in two or three dimensions. There are three reference systems that we're going to look at in this course. The first is rectangular. This is the one that will probably be most familiar to you. It's the one that we're going to go through in this video. And this is saying if you have, let's say, x y z coordinates and you had a particle here along some it's moving along some path you could draw a vector from your origin to your particle this would be your position vector r of t the position vector r of t would be given in terms of the x y z coordinates so you would have r of t is equal to x of t in the i direction plus y of t in the j direction plus z of t in the k direction. The next coordinate system that we'll be looking at in this course is normal and tangential components. And for this coordinate system, the origin actually is on the particle which is moving along the path. So let's say you have a path here and your particle is moving along that path then your normal direction is the direction towards the center of the curvature of that path, and your tangential direction would be moving tangential to the path of motion. So you'd have n going towards the center and your t um, going to, along tangentially to the path of motion. The third reference system that we'll look in this course is polar coordinates, and this is when you have a fixed origin and a fixed reference line here, and the information that you have about the position of the particle, so again, we'll have a path here, the particle is moving along that path, but the information that you're provided about the particle is a positive r, which would be a radial distance from the origin to the particle, and then you're also given an angle here, which is the counterclockwise angle between the fixed reference line and the r-axis. So this would be the polar coordinates. So we'll come back to normal, tangential, and polar coordinates in another video, but today we're going to come back to rectangular and look at what it means to define the motion in this way. I'm just going to move the screen up here. Actually, I'll leave this like that. Perfect. In this coordinate system, we have the x, y, and z values that are pointing along each coordinate system. And so in this case, we have i, a, j, and k, which are unit vectors, are unit vectors. So these are vectors that are pointing in a very specific direction, and they have a value of 1. And they each they point along the x, y, z axes, respectively. A unit vector is a vector of length 1, and it's used to represent spatial direction.
you'll see as we continue on why it's really important to denote the direction using i, j, and k. The magnitude of the position vector is the same as the magnitude of any vector. So it would be magnitude of r of t is equal to x of t squared plus y of t squared plus z of t squared, and then we take the square root of that. Now, to find the velocity vector, the velocity vector isn't changing from what we had before. So velocity is equal to the derivative with respect to time of the position vector, right? That's exactly what we've been saying all along. But because the position vector has three terms, we have to take the derivative with respect to time of each term. So you end up with d over dt of x i plus d over dt of y j plus d over dt of z k. Now, each of these terms, you have an x and an i. That means you have to use the product rule. So d over dt of x i is equal to dx over dt in the i direction, so the derivative of the first of the x times i plus x times the derivative di over dt. And I'm just going to write this out for the 3. So I've just drawn out the derivative with respect to time of the y and z components. Now in this case, and I've drawn on the side here, you can see that the i unit vector points along the x-axis, j points along the y-axis. And so in this case, what do you think the derivative of the i vector is with respect to time? Well, the derivative goes to 0 because this is a fixed system. So in this case, the i-coordinate system is not going to change with time because it's fixed. The other ones are not always that way, which is why I'm taking the time to derive this so that when we derive the equations for um, normal and tangential, you'll see that it's not exactly the same. So for this case, these terms will all go to 0. And you'll be left with the velocity vector is equal to the derivative of the position vector with, with respect to time, which is equal to dx over dt in the i direction plus dy over dt in the j direction plus dz over dt in the k direction. Here we're going to switch notation and d over dt can be represented by a dot. So I'm just going to rewrite this as velocity is equal to x dot i direction plus y dot j direction plus z dot k direction. You could also write this as velocity in the x direction i plus velocity in the y direction j plus velocity in the z direction k. The magnitude of the velocity vector is the speed. So speed, which is equal to just v without the vector notation, is absolute value of v of t, or sorry, magnitude, which is equal to vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared all square rooted. We derived this in an earlier video, but just a reminder that velocity is always tangent to the path of motion. I'm going to move this up so that we can look at acceleration. So for acceleration, we use the same steps as velocity, and the derivative of the unit vectors cancels out again. So acceleration is equal to the derivative of velocity with respect to time, which is equal to the derivative of each component, so the derivative of the velocity in the x direction with respect to time in the i direction, plus dvy over dt j plus dvz over dt in the k direction. In a simplified notation, so if you use dot notation, you have x double dot, oops, sorry, 
you have x double dot i plus y double dot j plus z double dot k. You could also write this as acceleration in the x direction i plus a y j plus a z k. In this case, you still would have the magnitude of a is the same formula, so a the magnitude is not a vector, is equal to the square root of each component squared. So ax squared plus ay squared plus az squared. The acceleration vector represents the time rate of change of both the magnitude and direction of the velocity vector. And so the acceleration is not tangent. tangent to the path of motion. And in fact, the acceleration always points towards the center of curvature. So let's say you had here, um, let's say you had x, y, and z, and you had your part of particle was sort of here, your acceleration of this particle would be pointing somewhere towards the center of curvature at that point. So acceleration always points towards center of curvature. I'm going to move this up now. And I just want to highlight something really, really important. If curvilinear motion is described using rectangular coordinates. The components of velocity and acceleration along each axis does not change direction. It only changes magnitude and sense, so it can go positive or negative along that axis. Therefore, Rectilinear motion can be assumed on each coordinate axis. And then you can apply the rectilinear relationship relations. And this will become a lot more clear when we get into an example.